our first try or speak now. And thank you for all being on video so we can see you. Because as I usually say, it's so much better to look at real faces and, um, and not just letters across the screen. So I appreciate I it. I have to agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I see. And Delilah is. Okay. We have another person. Yeah, I just let somebody else in. Oh, so. all right, great. Okay. Yeah, I'll so, take care of letting people in. I know you're a co-host, but I'll I can I can do oh, that. All right, thank you, Joan. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, it's, I think it's the same one as last time, but with a different date. So, um, welcome back to everybody who was here last week. Welcome, Alyssa. Nice to meet you. Um, mm -hmm. Glad to see you again. And I hope that last week was useful for you. And I did type a message um, a few minutes ago in the chat that said, if you have any lingering, you know, but lingering, they don't have to be lingering or kind of pertinent questions about last week, please write them in the chat and we can get to them um, today. But I do hope that last week was, um, was useful for you. And as you know, as you'll remember and say for Alyssa who um, wasn't here last week, the things that we talked about were kind of assessment in general what is it? Why is it important? Um, you know, kind of, I think we can all agree that it's important, but what are the impacts of assessment done well on students and just how much of our time as um, teachers is really devoted to assessment? So it's a, a big part of our, um, of our work. And we talked about the different purposes of assessment. We differentiated between assessment of learning, which um, is also often called summative assessment. And I think that's a really familiar term for people. And assessment for learning, which is very similar to formative assessment, the way it is commonly understood. But I said that I consider assessment for learning to be formative assessment plus, um, because a lot of the time when we think of formative assessment, we think of formative assessment giving us the teachers information that we can use to plan or to gauge how our students are doing. But in assessment for learning, a really important idea is that the students are users of assessment and, and involved in the assessment process too. Um, another thing we, we did last week is we looked at the five keys. There are five um, keys or qualities of high quality assessment for learning. Um, and we first one, it was that we have clear purposes for our assessment. Second one is clear targets. And so we spent really the majority of our time last week talking about clear targets. And that's really the first, well, I guess it's a second important step in, um, in planning quality assessment. But you know, once you know what the purpose is gonna be, you need to be clear with yourself and with students about what the targets of the assessment. And targets, as um, we mentioned last time, are the same things as what a lot of people call learning outcomes or learning objectives, what we want our students to know or be able to do uh, by the end of some learning experience. Um, and then th another thing we did was we did some practice, um, well, we talked about different types of learning targets and we spent some time categorizing them so that we could be clear about what types of um, targets we are aiming for in our instruction and we, um, classified our targets at, um, according to knowledge, reasoning targets, um, skill targets, product targets, and decision targets. And then the last thing that we did, or we started to do, is we talked about how sometimes the targets, especially when they're expressed as standards, they can be kind of complex, sometimes even unwieldy, multi-layered, and that it's really useful for assessment purposes and for teaching to unpack them or deconstruct them, like pick them apart into their underlying components so we can be more clear about what to teach and ultimately what to assess. So, um, you know, that's just a little recap of last week. And so for this week, um, you know, my learning targets for today are for us or, you know, for you to, to continue unpacking learning outcomes or learning targets for teaching and learning. Um, we're going to get to that third key of quality assessment, which is assessment design. And you know, the first step of, um, or you know, one important step of being able to select or um, create appropriate assessments is to kind of be clear about what the different assessment methods are. And even well, the next step, which I think is the most important is to match our learning targets with appropriate assessment methods. So we'll be 
spending some time doing that and talking about that. And then the last target is to um, identify ways to involve students in the assessment process because you, you know, in talking about assessment for learning, it's not something that's just done to students, um, but we want our students to be active participants in the process. Um, so that is, you know, what kind of I have on deck for today. And in terms of how um, I thought we'd organize our time, we would start, it kind of matches the, the learning targets, but we'd start with, de, you know, continuing to deconstruct some targets. I had left you last time with um, a, a link to a Google Doc, and I said, if you have time, you can work on this. If not, don't worry. Um, so we're going to start with this, and it, Kind of bring us back to the space where we left um, last time, um, looking at a real, you know, adult education learning target, and then kind of deconstructing it into its component parts. Then we'll talk about assessment methods, um, matching targets with methods, and involving students. It really follows the order of the um, targets. And in there, there will also be a break. I kind of thinking um, within number three. Um, that part of the, the um, session, but we'll see how things go as well. Definitely have a break, but that's where I'm thinking it would be. Any questions before we start? Okay, thank you, I guess not. All right, so um, you may remember that last time, um, the very end, I had um, said that I had a, a standard, it's an adult um, ESOL standard that we um, were going to unpack together. Um, and we didn't have time to do it together last time. So I had given you the link um, to look at this if you had time um, during the week, if you didn't, don't worry, but we're, oh, sorry, we're gonna start with this today. Um, and just to, well, like for Alyssa's purpose, we deconstructed a practice or a mock kind of standard or learning outcome last week. It was, you know, how to drive a car. It's something that maybe all of us in the session were familiar with. And that was, um, I, I always find that kind of fun for people to have that as a concrete example before we go into deconstructing a standard that we might use in our classroom. And so I am gonna share with you um, this link so that um, actually, so that you can go to the Google doc. Sorry. Thought I had this all ready for you. everyone. So I have just sent the link to that Google Doc and I'm going to actually share my screen of that doc right now. Sorry. One second. Okay, I can finally cut it. Okay, can you see the um, that document on the uh, on the screen? Yes. Okay, and so um, you know this standard, which I took from um, it was the Adult Education ESOL standards, is an English language learner can adapt language choices to purpose, task, and audience when speaking and writing, and um, you may remember from last week that the first thing that we do when we're um, breaking a standard down into its underlying learning targets or underlying parts is identify what the overarching type of um, target this is. And so who wants to take a stab at um, identifying, first of all, what kind of a, a learning target is this for students? Is it not a knowledge target, a reasoning target, a skill target, or a product target? And you can just speak, you can just say it if you want. Mm. 
reasoning? Um, tell me, was that Anne? Okay, tell yeah. me, tell me why you you would um, select reasoning. Because they have to um, sift through the different choices and evaluate them um, to reason uh, how to present uh, their speaking and their writing. Well, I, I will agree with you. I'm going to even write that um, and through. You said sift through and reason through different choices. Um, do you remember what the rest of your sentence was? <laughs> <laughs> to evaluate. To evaluate, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, what what the language you speak and write, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, to evaluate what, in? To evaluate what to um, speak and write. Okay, all right. Okay, now I, I agree with you and I, I love the way that you, um, that you express this. And is in terms of adapting their language choices for speaking and writing, is that something when the, the student is able to do that, is that something that they just do inside their heads, you know, as a reasoning process, so to speak, or is it something that they demonstrate or kind of act out or do? Hmm. And anyone else too? I don't want to put Ian on the spot. I would say it is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. And how come? Because how they will learn how to adapt language choices for their for a certain purpose in their speaking and writing. Mm -hmm. And okay. then they will have to actually do that. They'll have to perform it. They'll have to speak to you know, other people or they'll have to write it if they're writing notes or, or, or letters or things. So yeah. I, I would say that overarching, you know, kind of at the ultimate level, this is a skill that we want our English lear language learners to learn yeah. and yeah. show us that they can do. Mm -hmm. And, but one thing that is part of that skill of learning that skill, teaching it and assessing is that the students have to do a lot of reasoning to be able to adapt their language choices. Exactly what Ann said. Yes. They have to, they have to like think of these choices and evaluate what to say or what to write based on the purpose, based on whatever task it is they're um, you know, doing, whatever audience they are communicating with that. I mean, so that is if we're deconstructing, taking apart this learning target, that's a really important um, reasoning target that you have to teach and you'll want to assess as you're designing your, um, you know, your instruction to make sure students have, are able to do. What else? It's, what else underlies, you know, this, this skill, because remember we said that, okay, good, I see somebody writing. It's the anonymous, how do you spell it, say that? Leaguer, Liger? Oh. Okay. Skills. And feel free, anybody can write um, at the same time. So, you know, I would ask you as we're all looking at the screen to think what knowledge will students need to demonstrate this learning, you know, being able to adapt their language choices. What if maybe there are other reasoning processes they'll have to master? Are there other skills that underlie it um, as well? Okay. I, I was just going to say that in my experience, it's very unusual that a particular standard or a target falls into just one category because there's an overlap. And then obviously you need some underlying knowledge to be able to apply it, that mm -hmm. you can call it a skill, a specific detail that mm -hmm. you're looking for. And then you're also producing some product, even if the product is just an answer 
or if in this situation, speaking and writing, you're going to ask for a written product or you're asking for some kind of oral presentation, whether it's a sentence or a full presentation. So, you know, in this particular example, it's like all four categories. It's not just one in my mind. Well, I agree with you on like three quarters of that. Um, when you said it, you know, usually a standard isn't one that's there, overlapping. And I agree with you. And that's why I, you know, ask here, what's the overarching type, you know, like kind of at the highest mm -hmm. level is the skill, but definitely, like you said, there's knowledge that's needed. There's reasoning that has to take place. There are skills they have to show us. Like you said, they have to speak, they have to write. The only thing I don't agree with is you said like give an oral presentation um, and I think you may have given another example. And well, it said, are, yeah, it said we, when speaking and writing, so that written work is a product. If it's right. when they're speaking, whether it's writing class or if it's in an oral presentation type of speaking, it doesn't specify what kind of speaking. So essentially there could also be a product involved. That's what I meant. Oh, yeah. And I, I agree with you. And I would call that written um, written product or like an oral presentation. I'd say that's the assessment. That is what we do as instructors to gather the evidence that they have they have been, you know, they've mastered the underlying components of the standard. Um, so you know, I don't I don't agree that the product is part of the um, skill, but I, I agree that the product is what we require as an assessment to be able to know if they have acquired the skill. Donna, what do you think of that? I muted myself. Um, oh. I think that that's true sometimes, but sometimes the product is what you're looking for. You know, right. Taught in elementary as well as middle school and adult ed. In adult ed, we're not looking for products on our day to day. We don't ask for oral presentations or uh, written work every day in every you know situation. But in elementary school, the product isn't necessarily your assessment. The product is what you're going to use to see if they understood. Could they follow the directions? Mm -hmm. Could you know, so it depends on the circumstance. I'm just saying in this particular one, it's not clear. If, but that, I, I, listened to what, yeah. I, I listened to what you just said. The product mm -hmm. is what they do, or I think you said the product is what they do or you require to see if they understood. So really the, so it's essentially, the standard could, is what they understood, but the product mm -hmm. is how you're, you're that's is the assessment, how you're gathering the evidence. Mm -hmm. It's remember, we do have some standards that are products. Like if the standard was write a three part essay on, you know, I don't know. Um, right. something. Well, that, that's kind of where my, I, that's what my yeah. thing is too. Like when it said with speaking and writing, have you assigned some writing? Is that what you're after? I don't know. That's all. Right. Right. And so like if it was write a three part essay on some subject, then I would say that's a product target. Mm -hmm. Of course, right. that would be product right. that were inherent. And with mm -hmm. this one and I'm, you know, I'm I'm splitting hairs maybe a bit because I want to connect this to assessment choices later. But here, you know, what we're really, you know, the, the standard is about adapting language choices. Um, in speaking and writing. So that's a, a skill, something you can observe them do, whether they're speaking or whether they're, you know, writing something. And of course you'd have to see something to write. Um, so that's why I'm kind of insisting here about it being a skill. Um, but you would have to see either, uh, an, you know, a presentation, or, you know, an, or you'd have to see a written piece of work to be able to assess it. Hmm. Now, um, can I ask a question about this one here that I'm highlighting, vocabulary and nuances between words? Um, tell me, in what way would that be a skill? Um, that, is it the anonymous liger? Or, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Anybody, somebody want to explain that a little bit? 
Oh, how the nuances of vocabulary would be a skill? That's the question? Yeah, because it's in the skills column. So that's Yeah, well, you would have to have the vocabulary to know the difference between, if you were having to code shift, right, at the doctor's office, you wouldn't want to say, my ass hurts. You would want to say, excuse my language, right? You would want to say, my backside does not feel well. <laughs> right like you might you might say i and this is a thing i have with a lot of esl students where they don't know the difference because they don't have the vocabulary and that's part of switching you have to know the vocabulary the to each code right good and i agree so if they have to code ship know what's appropriate in certain certain yeah situations. so like knowing like when it's okay to say the word ass as opposed to behind like okay. sometimes it is okay if you're in a friend circle circle that's not a big deal Okay, so that knowing it is mm -hmm. a knowledge is knowledge. That's a knowledge target. Something that you would teach them. When is it okay to use this kind of language? When is it um, okay to say something else, or even to you know um, to use your words from a minute ago that they would need to understand the voc vocabulary and nuances. But they would not, not only would they need to understand it though, they actually need to know those particular, they need to have those words under their belt as a skill. They need to under, yeah. it's, it is knowledge, yes, but it's actually like a lot of times like my students like didn't know the difference between a headache and a head pain. Mm -hmm. So like I just recently had this conversation with some of my students about how they would go to the doctor and they said they, I have, they have a head pain because they don't know the word ache. So mm -hmm. the doctor, like thinking, oh, you have a pain, not realizing that those, that word pain is more severe than ache. Right. And so what you're, what you're talking about, knowing the difference between a headache and a head pain, that's knowledge. Using but I'm saying that the vocabulary is the skill part. They actually have to have the vocabulary. I, I just, whether they, they use it or not is a different use, thing, but like if they yeah. don't know the word exists, it doesn't matter. But Carrie, we would, we would put it in both places then. Oh yes, yeah, of course. Have to you know it, it. I'm just saying and then they have to be able to part. use it. So <laughs> you would have, so you, I mean, you can't say just knowing vocabulary is a skill, knowing it is knowledge, but using it appropriately. This skill. Okay. And you know, that would be a skill or your, as you said before, code shifting, you know, just being able to do that automatically depending on you know, who you're talking to and things. When you're, when you're saying, so I was just going to add, you know, when you're saying this about vocabulary, what always comes to mind for me is, you know, when somebody just gives a basic, here's your vocabulary test and here's a bunch of words I need you to know versus the application of those words in real context. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, to me, it's a big difference. How do you, you know, if you're assessing whether they can use them appropriately, you're not just giving a plain old <laughs> spell the word correctly list because that's just not going to get the student. Oh, 100%. The student but I think that the skill part that I'm kind of arguing is that if they don't know the word exists in the first place, because Absolutely. we have so many words in English, <laughs> yeah. that one thing, the application is a separate thing. I totally agree. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I, we're, saying, we're where, saying exactly the same thing. You just, you, what you did was bring to mind for me things I've seen people do and think they're doing one thing, but yet they're doing something else. So no, we're saying the same thing, Carrie. Yeah, and I agree. And I, I think we have here the continuum of what you're talking about, too. you got to know, um, you know, you have to have knowledge. Then, in, you know, as uh, I think it was Anne said, you have to, in your mind, you have to reason and like sift through what's appropriate. And then you have to use it appropriately. So it's like kind of multi-step um, in this way. All right. Anything else before we... Um, any other knowledge or reasoning or skill that you would think would underlie this particular standard? Okay. Well, then I'm going to share a different screen, but the, the discussions we're having are good and it really forces us to be clear, you know, about what we're talking about and especially if you have multiple people teaching, um, you know, in the same um, setting, you know, maybe the same levels, it's helpful to be clear about that thing, about that, because you may have, you know, different people working on the same thing and students could be experiencing vastly um, different 
instruction for what's supposed to be really the same, um, the same standard. And I'm going to swap this. Okay. All right. So this I just wanted to kind of, you know, I'm giving this, this here just as a little reminder from last time, and it, it's really kind of what we did a, a, a few minutes ago. You know, when the overarching type of a, a standard or an out uh, uh, target is knowledge. There are knowledge underpinnings, of course. If it's reasoning, there's knowledge and reasoning that underlies it. If there's skill, if it's a skill target, like with this one, um, there's knowledge, reasoning, and skill that underlie it. And then if there's if it's a product, it's going to be all of these. Um, we talked last time about, you know, according to the literature, sometimes skill is um, part of it. But I think I think it was Anne was it Anne last week who identified. Um, an example of maybe when a skill wouldn't be necessary to, for, you know, creating a product, but it's, it's pretty rare. Okay. So now I, um, I hope you'll understand in a, in a couple of minutes why I've been to like focusing so heavily on the targets and like what type are they. Um, and that's because I really want to shift into assessment methods. And that's that third key for um, assessment for learning. And is something that really made me think about assessment differently um, when I was learning about this is that to think that, you know, we have many assessment strategies we use, you know, tests and multiple choice and true false and projects and oral presentations and just, you know, listening to students as they work. These are all things we do um, to assess students. But what's interesting to me is that all, of all the assessment strategies we have, they all belong to one, either one of four different assessment methods. And so that's really what surprised me when I was learning this, that there, overall there are four types of assessment or four assessment methods. And I, I know that you're familiar with these. I mean, the first assessment method is so what we call selected response. And it's um, kind of like what sometimes is called an objective test. Um, it's where students select the correct or the best response from a list. And so we've got multiple choice and true, false and matching, or even if it's just fill in the blank. So there's one correct answer that's considered a selected response assessment method as well. Um, another type of assessment is written response. And I know you're all familiar with this and that's you know, a little different from here but it's when students construct a written answer to a response in response to a question or a task instead of just selecting one from a list or instead of just writing a single word. And when we're using written response um, assessments, we also usually do the scoring with a rubric or some kind of scoring guide where we can judge the levels of quality. And then performance assessment is another type, and I, I know that you use this a lot. And that's when you, your assessment is based on observation of a real-time performance or the creation of a product. So if I see my students conduct an oral presentation uh, or I require them to do that, that's a performance assessment. On the, by the same token, if I... Um, you know, if I ask them to create a 3D model of some mathematical or scientific um, principle, that's a product that I'm asking them to create and it's a performance assessment as well. And really like a written response um, assessment method, we have two parts, the task or the exercise that we have students do and a scoring rubric or guide. And then the fourth um, kind of assessment or fourth, fourth method is really personal interaction. And that is, it can be formal, it can be informal, but that's where we gather information about our students through structured and unstructured, oops, sorry, interactions with them. Um, maybe just asking questions during instruction, maybe more during more um, formal kind of um, activities like interviews with the students or conferences to check on how they're doing. Um, we can also um, assess students' participation just by watching them, kind of keeping track of what they do. Um, an oral exam is a uh, personal interaction assessment too, where we interact with the students, um, but that's kind of a formal um, way of doing it. 
We might ask our students to keep journals or logs of what they're thinking, what, they're, what they think they've learned. Um, and then there's a classification of, or not a, a group of assessments that are called class, um, classroom assessment techniques, which um, I, I used uh, at least one last week and I, I bet you do too. Um, classroom assessment techniques are quick, you know, simple, ungraded, anonymous activities that are where students don't necessarily have to, um, you know, write their name. But there are things that we as teachers um, ask our students to do to give us and to give them helpful feedback on the teaching and learning process as it is happening. Like, um, you know, I think maybe you've used like KWL, you know, sometimes at the beginning of a, a lesson or a unit where you ask students to identify, like, what do they already know about something? Um, what do they wonder about it? What do they want to learn? And then maybe at the end, what have they learned about it? Or I often use the three, two, one at the end of a, a session of, you know, ask people, what are three things you learned today? What um, are two um, questions you have? And what is one thing, or what are two things that aren't clear? And like, what's one question you have? And that really, it, it allows them to kind of synthesize and integrate what they're learning and allows me to know how things have worked. Um, another classroom assessment technique that's really an, an interaction, um, a personal interaction assessment is called the muddiest point. And you may, you know, you may use this as well. And that's where you ask students, um, you know, at a certain point in a lesson, maybe at the, the end, um, yeah, it depends on what works for you, to write down like the most difficult or the most confusing part of a lesson, you know, or a class, or they could just talk about it. You know, certainly with some of our ESL students, they wouldn't be able to maybe write it um, very easily. Um, another technique is the minute paper. Um, and that's often used as an introductory, you know, learning strategy. And um, that's where the, the teacher asks the, the students or gives the students exactly one minute to write a response to something, a prompt or a question. It could be, what have you learned? Or what do you know about this? Or what is this? Um, the Freyer model, um, and I'm gonna share this with you and I have some notes in here that you can look at too is um, another useful, quick, pretty easy classroom assessment technique that can be used for um, kind of personal interaction with students. And that's, if this is more, um, this is more visual. It consists of a, a square with four quadrants and in the middle um, you, you put like a concept or something that, that the, you're focusing on class. And you ask the, um, the students to identify, to explain the characteristics and give examples and give non-examples, like what is this not? And these are uh, quick, um, I say easy, but they, they certainly are simpler to develop than some of the other assessments that you can do pretty, um, that do pretty quickly, that you don't have to grade them. They're good examples of this personal interaction kind of assessment. Um, and I have found they're pretty easy to do virtually as well um, with the, the Zoom chat. Sometimes I do that or with Slido that I um, used with you last week or with Google Docs like you've done where you know there's something prepared and everybody responds. Um, I've used Kahoot for some um, activities like these, but these are, you know, they're, they're, I share them out, you know, as a, on a specific um, slide or screen, just because I think they're important, you know, as um, examples of personal interaction kinds of um, assessments. And before I go on, um, do any comments or reactions to, you know, the the classification of assessment strategies into four different methods. Okay, I will take that as a no for now. So then I have just a quick question. I'm just wondering, are these things that people are doing 
in in adult ed classes or are there are there they want they know they want to do more of i'm just kind of curious yeah but that's chat or open mic either one yeah. good question john so we're definitely doing all now mm -hmm. i i just say i uh, want to say that select response uh assessments does not really reflect uh student learning deep student learning okay uh because you know sifting through a list i mean uh, true mm -hmm. or false or you know which one is mm -hmm. the correct one it you know oftentimes it gives a false impression yeah. about the student learning mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, while written response or performance assessment does give me more of what, you know, of an assessment of what my students have learned. Yeah. You know, I hate, I actually hate the select response question. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I... A very I, deep assessment. I, I, I don't like it. I mean... Yeah. And I, I agree I'm with sorry. you. It even gives the student himself or herself a false impression yeah. that they have learned. Yeah. yeah, I will not argue with a word you're saying. Um, and you are right. A selected response is really not appropriate for, for deep learning. I mean, sometimes, and this is, again, I want to make the connection between the, the learning target types. Selected response is is okay for maybe assessing some knowledge targets. Like if you want to establish some base knowledge or understanding before you go on to something more complex and you might want to be, you might want to quickly assess whether they've got these main ideas before they go into the deep things, you might want to give a quick selected response um, assessment, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not useful for measuring um, deep learning. It's not useful for complex reasoning, um, even a lot of deeper kind of knowledge types of targets. So I agree with you. And, and one thing, you know, I think that, um, well, I've certainly has experienced is that selected response is easy to grade. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had my own kids in school and they're being assessed on like a skill and they it's a it's a multiple choice test it's completely doesn't get at the skill like you were saying uh, Delila but they can they can put the scanner scan sheet through a machine and get the the grade really quickly but it it's um it's not ideal and I will I always do point out like there there is no um evil assessment method. Sometimes people say you should never use selected response ever in your life because it's just bad. I mean, if you want it, you need a quick and dirty kind of assessment of, of knowledge, by all means do a selected response. But after Leela, I, I agree with you about other methods really yielding more meaningful information. So I would just, I would agree with all of that, except unfortunately in adult education, most of our students are here to get their GED. The GED are for 90% or more selected responses, their multiple choice. And unfortunately we spend a lot of our time just teaching the students the best strategy to mm -hmm. answer a multiple choice test. Yeah. The class is the same. Know, they, they want us <laughs> to teach specific skills Mm -hmm. but that's not the way the actual GED test is set up. So, you know. And, and I think there's a real, a place for like, you know, test prep in class. And you, we know multiple choice kinds of um, assessments, especially for students who come from different cultures and they've never encountered that way of testing. It's just a, a whole different way of approaching um, an assessment. And I think that there's a lot of um, place for, test prep and test strategies. But you know, one thing like research has shown us is that if students are doing deeper work in class where they have to show their knowledge in, in written um, response, through written response or performance assessments, 
and they get it, they're going to do well on the um, the selected response if they know the strategies. You know, for for oh, um, you know, like give them clues. If, if one of the responses is way longer than the other, maybe that's the right answer. You know, or something like that. But, we do. Um... For the bridge program, we actually do a like a vocabulary and contextualized like topic driven curriculum. And then out of the eight weeks, maybe the last week is test prep. Okay. So, so trying to be really explicit and not, not just because the GED, um, like the selected response format is not valid but also because there's a significant number of people in every class who actually aren't gonna pass the test anytime soon. And so it's really important, at least for me and what I encourage my staff to do is to highlight that the participation in class and the engagement and the improvement of their ability to vocalize, speak, write, um, and read is actually the most significant impact. And there's you know statistical data that backs that up. So, um, mm -hmm. And, mentioning. No, and I, I, I think that's a great example. And it's a, it also a perfect example of Beatrice of the mismatch between the learning targets and the assessment method, because the students, you know, you have this contextual, <laughs> the, the good curriculum and way of approaching it. And, and it's, you know, very likely the students have gotten what you're, what you're teaching and these important concepts or skills, but then they're not able to display it some of them in a multiple choice test. And it's not because they don't, for some of them, it's not because they don't have the skills or the knowledge, but it's not, it's not the, always the appropriate way or the best way for them to show it. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm gonna ask you to do something now, just as a little bit of practice. Um, I, let me, I'm going to send you a, another link in the chat. And ask you to go to, yeah, go to this link. And I'm going to um, share my screen so you can see what I'm, I want to what we're going to do. Are you there? Can you see? Are you at? Yes. Okay. So um, this is what you should see. And this is a tool I, I use in um, my classes a lot of the time. Um, and I don't know if you have, but I, I really, I really like it. And you, it's called Flippity and you can use it for different kinds of um, activities with students. But just kind of as, as a practice of thinking about these assessment methods, um, I'm going to ask you, and you could do it in alone or in pairs. I could um, let you, I, in a minute, I will um, change the settings so everybody can share their screen if they want. But I'd like you to, to look at these um, different terms here. And I'd like you to, I mean, you can see in color, I've got the, those four different kinds of um, assessment methods. And you can move them around because they're like manipulatives. And I'd like you to look at the different assessment, I'll call them assessment tasks or strategies and classify them. You know, so if I ask students to do an essay, you know, what kind of a, um, assessment method am I using? And you can move this and you can organize this however you want. You could do it in columns or in, in rows, or you could do a diagram or something. But just to think of what are the different options we have for in these four different methods. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of assessment strategies for each method. But just, um, I'm going to give you a few minutes, ask you to move these around on your own screen, whatever you have, nobody on your screen, if you're moving things, nobody else can see it um, unless you wanna share. But um, I thought I would put you into pairs if you wanted to talk about this um, or do it together. First, let me, I'm going to, 
going to go to share screen. I'm going to let you. I want to allow you to share your screen if you want. So let me. Sorry about this. Yeah, it should be set up so anyone oh, can is? share a screen. Yeah. Oh, all right. I usually, okay. Sorry, I usually leave oh. it open so anyone. Oh, can good, share. good, good. Well, then I will. You don't have to be a co-host or oh, anything. Sorry, uh, it's my, great. my okay. fault. Okay. So, well, I'll just put mine back on, and then I'm going to. Yeah, yours is not showing, by the way. So oh, it isn't. Okay. No. Well, yeah. let me at least put you into groups of two, and you can, um, if you want to, you know, talk about these together. Um, how many people do we have, Joan? Can you see? I have to go. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for making or being able to come for this much of the time. Um, uh, Joan, we will have a recording of this, so feel uh, I'll send it to you so you can keep watching and, and to get the rest of it. So we Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to put you into four rooms if you don't, um, and then you'll be randomly put together, but why don't you take just a couple of minutes to... Um, categorize these and see if we agree or everybody agrees. Okay, I think everybody's in a... Um, yeah, everyone's in a room and he's leaving, so he's yeah, not I, in a room. I um, somebody did that on purpose. Him and I moved her into a different room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll just okay. I'll bring, them, I'll bring them back in a, a minute or so. Okay, it won't take them long to do that. What time are we at? Two fifty. Okay. Oh, you know what, Carrie's. Mm -hmm. Carrie's in a room with Melinda, but Melinda's got her eye. I don't know which room Melinda oh, is in. Oh, yeah. Because she's got two yeah. things going. Oh, you're right. I'm going to go so in. So either Donna okay. or Carrie is not with anyone. Oh, wow. All right. Maybe I'll put them all into the same room. I'm going to do that. I'm going to move all of them to. If you can, yeah, if you can move, yeah. if you can move Carrie and Donna into the other room, then you could probably better. And Donna and Melinda, I'm going to put her. I'm going to just join room, th room three just to tell them what's, what's happening. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So they should. So really, I only have two rooms. Yeah. Okay. So that worked out. Now they're, yeah, they're all yeah. in there and that works. And so now I have just, it's just two rooms. Um, room one has three people and room three has three. Okay. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because the group's not that big. So, right. Yeah. And Melinda, it gets confusing thinking she's, two she, people. yeah. So she's in her car. Oh, okay. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Glad I noticed that because otherwise someone would have been by themselves. It's never a good feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to room one, see how they're doing or if they're. Hey Jane. Hey Joan. Um, oh, people are in break in breakout rooms. Yeah. Okay. So you know what? I'm gonna send you to room three. So.
I'm going to bring people. So Jane, Jane just joined us. So I just plopped her in the third room just so oh. that she'd be with the other people. So. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to close the booms though and bring them back because they were done over there. Um, oh, okay. They have a minute. So Jane can get brought up to speed. She wants. Forty-eight seconds. <laughs> so then with Jane here, we have three, four, five, six, seven people total. Besides you and me. Okay, that'll be good for the next activity. Next activity I'll do. Probably it's only seven people. I'll figure it out. All right. Hi, Jane. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody, again. Um, would anybody like to share their screen to show how they um, organize the different assessment strategies according to the four methods? Mm. Isn't it so funny how quiet people get once they get to the big crowd? And they're so <laughs> tired. Yes. <laughs> no, I had mine organized, but when I don't know, like another person came in the room, the whole thing like yeah. separated. So I don't have it anymore. Really? It's not organized, in other words. Really? Yeah. 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 Did that happen to mine you too? Oh, really? it disappeared. Yeah. I don't yeah. know where it went. So <laughs> yeah, mine oh. did too. Okay. Okay. okay I'm but, glad to know it wasn't just me. But <laughs> Beatrice was able to share hers though yeah beatrice is yours still intact yeah it is i can share it i'm just trying okay. not to talk too much because i usually talk too much yeah. <laughs> maybe you share it and then we can see if other people agree okay so i see you like um kind of place the different assessment strategies on top of or around the the different the types yeah i mean because i sort of started thinking of it as like a or like so, so for instance, debate, right? Maybe goes here. Perform. It's like it's it's more of a personal interaction than a presentation, but it's still like I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would put. I mean, most of the time, personal interaction. Most of the time, it's personal interaction between you and the student. Um, or your observation of the student. Debate, I mean, I, I can see why you almost have it in the middle. I put debate under performance because yeah. generally students all have their roles and then they have to kind of act out, you know, the debate taking different opinions and things like that. So um, I was actually thinking of it more under performance assessment. Let's see. I'm, I don't want to talk. Other people have any questions or did you put anything differently? I think I think I might put thesis under written response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I would agree with you. Um, let's see. Beatrice, do you want to explain why you, I think you put thesis under selected response or? Oh, no, I just didn't even get there yet. Oh, all oh. right. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay. Then That's I would agree. I would agree. Realize, actually, this one should go up here, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Incomplete. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. There we go. go. Good. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you, Anne, but I would put thesis under written along with short answers and essay like you have there. Um, let's see, observation and oral interview and conference and group discussion, I would put under personal assessment and a group discussion is when you as kind of the, the instructor are observing people. Debate we talked about, um, I would put it more under performance assessment. They've also got their presentation recital, 
and project demonstration should or probably report. put diagram too under performance i would i would put diagram under performance assessment think you know assuming it's something they have to create uh -huh. um, that you can look at about that i would definitely keep that in written i mean mm. especially if you're talking about things like like okay show me show me make me a graph with a slope of negative one you know that's a written response okay it's not words but it's still <laughs> well and that i mean here again i'm i'm splitting hairs for the purpose of being able to make sure our um our assessment's correct, but you're right. It's not words. And for that reason, it's not a written response. You know, mm -hmm. like I would put it under performance assessment. I wouldn't it, put it under performance because it's not active. There's no. But performance assessment is when they have to create a product or they, per they perform and demonstrate a skill in real time. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. You put survey and true false multiple choice under selected response. Um, art exhibition, is that where were you putting that? I guess it's under perform, it's performance. It's okay. sort of should be okay. there. All right. Anybody else have questions or comments? Okay, I am going to I know about survey. A survey, well, and you know, it's a good question, Anne, because I had been thinking that too. A survey, um, if it's closed ended, you know, if it's like, you know, rate on a scale of one to five, um, oh. or choose, you know, strongly agree, somewhat agree, disagree, then it's selected response. Yeah, yeah. But if it's a survey so where you actually, you know, write your comments and things, then it would be a written response. Right. Yeah. And also sometimes okay. I've seen people assign to, for students to develop surveys or conduct surveys. So then I guess it would be performance. Yeah, yeah. So that depends on how the survey is used in yeah. that instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I just want to, let me see. Um, sorry. Can I stop sharing? Sure, yeah, yeah. And I just, just let. And this is kind of the way I had um, organized things, which is pretty much, ex pretty much the same as what we just looked at. I think our, the diagram was the one that, um, that Beatrice, you know, I think said she thought it should go over here, but these are clearly performance assessments. And um, I can't remember where you put oral interview, Beatrice, but if, if it's you interviewing the student, we, we, that's yeah, a formal under personal. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, if you have, if you ask a student to produce a diagram and it aligns with the, the target, fine. Um, a written assessment I see is something where they're actually writing narrative or text, um, you know, connected text. So I would um, really put it there, but um, let's go on right now. Um, let me share again. One second. Well, sometimes my Zoom menu just like disappears. Does that happen to anybody else? Yes. <laughs> All right, let me go back. All right, okay. So now I'm gonna, uh, let me, trying to swap there. So let's try and, um, you know, make some of this, or put some of this kind of into a, a more concrete situation. So I have here, and I, um, I, I have again a Google Doc that I'm going to share with you, but got some scenarios, you know, that are real scenarios that you probably encounter as um, a teacher. Like, for example, you know, you have some knowledge targets for your students and you want your students to master specific subject matter knowledge because it represents an important foundation for later work. 
Um, and then there's a reasoning example, a skill example, a product example, and one a disposition. And so my, I what I'd like you to talk about and kind of assess is how effective do you think each of these assessment methods is for assessing each target type? And so I'd like you if in the Google Doc just to write um, strong or good or partial or poor um, based on what you think. But strong if you think the method works for all learning targets of this type. So for example, if you think selected response as an assessment type works for all knowledge targets, you'd put strong. If you think it works for many of the learning targets of that type, it would be a good match. Partial means it might work in some instances and poor if the method from your experience never works with learning tar targets of this type. And I really wanted to put you into groups for this. Um, how about for now, um, we have, I think we have six or seven people. Um, let me just, or 10, okay. So, so you want us to open the Google Doc someplace else? Um, yeah, just on your own screen, um, or you could even copy it. Um, well, okay. So did we, you share it in the chat? Did you, how did you I share it? I oh, haven't yet. Oh, I'm going to do it now. Let me do it now before I figure out how to. Because um, sometimes does it get lost if it's shared in the chat? You can't, oh, you have to open it up ahead of time. Yeah, so Susan, I just shared it because I have, oh, I have thank, it from your oh. PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. Okay. So that should get everyone to, if it doesn't get everyone to it, let me know. Okay. So on it. Melissa, Ann, Jane, Beatrice, Carrie, Melinda. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven people. Um, I'm twice, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I only counted you once. <laughs> I, I asked. I jumped on a phone instead of the computer. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. No, it that happens all the time that people do that. So you I'm gonna solved it, Melinda. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm gonna um, break you into three rooms. If okay. you're in if so you're awesome. in room if you're in room one, I'd like you to work on knowledge, which is number one in the document. If you're in room two, I'd like you to work on reasoning, which is number two in the document. And if you're in room three, I'd like you to work on um, skill in the document. And then if you have extra time, go on to product and, and disposition. But you all will be, each of you will be responsible for one of the, the target types. And um, I'll give you, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes to kind of talk this over. And you can actually put in the document your group's judgments of whether it's strong or good or you know partial, um, and then we'll we'll talk about that um, after. Is that clear to you in terms of instructions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so let me go to breakout rooms, and I am going to. I have to. Well. I will just move people because it's sometimes hard to start breakup rooms again. So now we've got one room with two and one with three and two with two. Okay, so I'm going to open the rooms. 10 minutes, the maximum, and I'll check in with you.
There was a lot of conversation in the room I was in about selected response and how it is so important for those who are doing GED and how it is, how they teach and, 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 and it, anyway, there's a lot of conversation about exploring yeah. that further. And there was just some in the room I was in too. And, and I, you know, I, I, one way I, maybe I could say it to the whole group is that yeah, as we're recording, it'll be on here anyway. So. Oh yeah, just that you know, our goal isn't to to imitate or mimic the the GED or the standardized testing, and that they use the the multiple choice a lot just because it's cheap, you know, it's fast. Not always the the best way of getting at the targets. And in class, in the classroom, we would want to use different methods. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that matches. Well, some well, some of the one of the examples I heard explored the idea of well, why did you pick that, and then that to me is more the assessment of why did you pick that to explore the vocabulary you decided, you know, and all those other pieces. So even though that's the choice, that's not how you're assessing whether the student knows it or not. It's really the questions you're asking afterwards. So mm. okay, yeah, that oh, was my take on it. Okay, good. And what time do you, Jay? Joan, did you take note of what time we went into groups? Um, no, but I saw something that said we either had been in it for X number of minutes oh, or whatever. Gosh. Yeah, I can do that. Let's see. Okay, there's only one more minute left. So when that minute is uh, up and they we are brought together, I'm gonna give people a break, okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back again. So why don't I close, maybe close the rooms too. So they, yeah, they'll be back and pretty quickly. Twenty six seconds. Can up oh, hi, Jane. <laughs> people um, have started to fill in the um, table. I, can you see my screen that has the, okay. So um, I'd love to talk about this after we take a break. Okay. So um, it is three night, is everyone back? Let, I want to make sure I don't start this till everyone is here. Everyone is back from the breakout rooms, I think. Okay, um, let's take a break. It's 3.20 now till 3.25, and then we will come back and talk about your, your choices here and why and, and go on, okay? So see you in five minutes. Bye.
Good, 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 good. So much better. Hello. My boss just told me the same thing in Connecticut about her dog, period. Ours were. Set three. All right, 325. Okay, thank you. I see every, all of the boxes are um, filled out. I think I'm, yeah, I'm sharing my screen and you've all put strong, you know, uh, the range from poor to strong. And I think what I'm going to do now, just so that we can maybe highlight like really salient points, is I'm going to share a different screen with you and ask you to compare what you put in the Google Doc to what I get. Um, Oops, to what I have here. So um, here is, um, it's a kind of a grid that shows the match between different um, assessment methods and what, the different targets. And you had examples of those in the, um, the Google Doc. But here you can see, um, kind of the alignment that we use for between the different assessment methods and target types. And I, I noticed just looking at what you put down on the screen and, and what I have here, that some of them are exactly the same. Um, but give me a chance to look at that and ask you if you have any comments, questions, or maybe if, if this alignment. Well, I just I just have a, a comment just because I've noted like under product, you have that um, performance assessment would be would be poor. Yet one of the products that you're wanting to assess is their samples of their writing and term papers. And so if yeah. they turn that in, would why would that be a poor yeah. way? And the exception to that is for written written products. You're exactly right. And okay. yeah, if the product is a written product, written response is by far, it, it is the, the, the way to go. Yeah, so I agree with you. And I, I toyed with 
putting that exception right here on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, I have some, I have in this slide deck, I have some slides that I'm not going to show or talk about today, but that kind of explain, the, you know, some of these nuances more mm -hmm. closely, close or clearly, or maybe in more detail that you can look at after. And in, for example, in one of those, it talks about if the, the product is writing, oh, of course, the written response is going to be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other ones or any points that you would question, disagree with, wonder about? So the one we, we had skill and we talked about skill of being able to communicate um, in conversation in English. Um, and so again, you have personal interaction, you have, you know, kind of partially. And we thought that was strong because if I could have a person, if I could have a conversation with you and you and I can have a conversation, that's a great way to assess if you can do it. Right. And so really, it is, you can see here, it's a strong match for some or maybe all oral communication proficiencies, right. but for other skills that are more, um, you know, that maybe are demonstrations of more mechanical or technical skill, it might be, it is less of a good match. So that's why it's partial. So again, Jane, I agree. Just to you. clarify, it wasn't, it wasn't specifically just to that example you gave. That was that example was just an example and not oh. the example we should have been looking at. Are you asking me or are you asking yes, Jane? Yes, I'm asking you. Oh, okay. Um, the personal interaction is a great assessment method for oral communication kind of skills. You could use it for a host of other skills. But sure, no, I, I follow that. But I think what I'm saying is that on the side, on the left of that row, on the very left of that row, not, it's not here, but on our sheet, it said the task was this, X, the task was for an English language learner to have a conversation. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, it would be strong. Yes or no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we took your examples literally. Okay. So we, and some we of the based examples our answers were more, on your example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some of the examples were more literal themselves. You know, some yeah. were more general and some were, you know, kind of, oh, yeah. you want to assess a skill. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. And what else? Anything else here? Wonder about? It's one thing I'll point out is some, for some of them, the reason that they might not be strong or they might only be partial is because you certainly could assess a learning target one way, but it might take you a long time. You just might not have enough time in a classroom. So for example, you know, when I was thinking of skill, um, if, if students were, um, you know, learning to you know, do a dance or something like that. You could just use personal interaction, but you might not have time just to watch them informally. You may have to set up an actual exhibition you know, time mm -hmm. just for the sake of, of, of time. Um, for knowledge, for example, um, written response is a really good um, way of assessing knowledge. And it's so it's strong. It, it can get at all elements of the target, but sometimes we can't do it realistically because it takes too long. If we just want to, you know, test students on their foundational skills for something, maybe before we go on to something else, we might have to do a quick um, selected response exam because we just, or exam, like quiz, because you just don't have time to read 30 essays, you know. Um, so that can really factor into some of these, like for, um, let's see some of the other ones. Um, yeah, I mean, disposition, you can certainly talk with students individually about their feelings, which is great to get to know them, but you, you might not have enough time to talk to each student individually. So, um, but I think the thing to really pay attention to here is where the matchers are poor. For example, if you, you want to um, assess a student's ability to have an oral conversation in English, 
you're not going to have them write an essay, you know, where if you want to assess their ability to create a product, you're not going to have it write an essay unless it's a written product. Um, and multiple choice, for example, would not, would be a very, you know, it's a poor way of assessing uh, ability to create a product. As some of you pointed out, you might be able to assess the underlying knowledge, but not um, the actual product target itself. And I, I sometimes, uh, I will share this with people and I don't know if you'll find it any more useful than, than the other <laughs> chart, but um, you know, uh, so sometimes it's a lot of words to look at that other chart. So I, you know, sometimes we'll just use emojis like the, the open mouth smile is supposed to be strong. Like it's supposed to be a happier, happier yeah. face than the, the, the smile here. I don't know if it's the that smart. clear. <laughs> yeah, but here, you know, the, the yellow with just a straight line, that's kind of the, the yellow light. It's, it's partial. The red is poor, like a stop, don't do it. And the greens are all, you know, they're good to strong um, ways to assess different, um, different learning targets. And so, you know, one thing I, I will point out is, um, you know, good assessment means knowing what to choose, you know, the best way of getting the job done of assessing students on the different learning targets that we, um, that we are teaching. And I think we have to keep in mind the realities of our, our work and Sometimes you have to pick certain methods because they are efficient um, or you can get them done with it with the time that you have available and where maybe the best match might be something that you just don't have time for. So sometimes you have to go to what's a good match. Um, I would point out that no assessment method is inherently superior. All are viable if they're used well. Even selected response, it can be completely, completely appropriate um, to assess kind of lower level knowledge targets in a quick way. Um, and I know some of you have pointed out like the GED and some of the standardized tests that the students, your students take, which are selected response. And, mm -hmm. you know, the format is intentional, intentional in the, the makers of these assessments have had to um, take some of the same things into consideration that you do in a classroom. and. For some of the targets that are being assessed in the GED, for example, written response or even a performance would be more appropriate, but it, they, the, they could never, um, there aren't enough funds or time to design an assessment program that would have um, you know, millions of students doing performance assessments or writing, you know, writing long essays. And for that reason, sacrifices have been made and everything or just about everything is selected response. And um, as I was saying to somebody a couple of minutes ago, you know, for us, we, as I said, I think test prep strategies really are, have a place when our students do have to take high stakes assessment. But for us in the classroom, I think we have the luxury that maybe the designers of the GED don't have of using different types of assessments and having them be maybe more appropriate to the learn, learning targets more of the time. Um, again, the key is to select the right method for the, the right target in our classrooms. And one thing we haven't talked about um, to yet is that it's really, well, we talked a little bit about it last week about sharing the learning targets with students. Um, but also, you know, I, I think to go even a step farther, or farther um, write and share for student friendly targets for the students, maybe in student language or to adjust the language for our ESL OL students so that they can see in words they understand what it is they're expected to learn. And you know, I wanna bring us back to where we started um, or one of the places we started last week. And that was, you know, assessment for learning is, is built around these five keys, you know, clear purposes, why are we assessing, and what are, you know, what, for what purposes um, we need to be clear about our targets, are, you know, what are the learning targets, are they clear, are they good, um, we've gotten just a little bit into just sound design, just where we would need a whole lot more time together than we have to, you um, to go beyond making sure we're using the appropriate method. 
we don't have time in, in these two sessions to really talk deeply about effective communication um, of results and you know, feedback with students, but I would like to spend a little time um, in the little bit of time we have left talking about student involvement. That's the fifth key and it's really crucial to assessment for learning. And that's keeping in mind that students are users of assessment too, not just us, not just our programs, not just you know, the state or whoever. Um, students can track their own progress or we would like them to be able to track progress and communicate their own progress to us and others. They need to understand the targets. We've talked about that. And they can actually partake in assessment through self-assessment or peer assessment, um, things like that. And I want to remind you too, assessment for learning centers on three student um, level questions. You know, where am I going as a student? So what are those targets? Where am I now? You know, what do I know? What don't I know? Or what do I, can I do? What can't I? And what do I need to do to get to that next level? And so I have a, you know, a question for you. Um, you know, we, we've talked about these a little bit about these four different types of assessment methods. And I'm wondering, how could you use each assessment method um, so that the students in your class could answer the questions that pertain to um, assessment for learning. You know, where am I going? Where am I now? Where to next? How, how could you use those assessments to involve students in the process? And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. And I'm gonna try and see you because I can only see my screen. Anybody have, or maybe a way that you would do? So, so I think the one, two, and four are essentially relatively easy. Three is a little bit more difficult. Um, but I think, you know, I think we have done selected response assessments in terms of, of like, you know, a quick Google form of, you know, are you meeting your goals? Like, are you meeting your goals? What's your next step? Um, you know, we, we do it with our students kind of at a midpoint and at the end of the year, like, what's the next step? Where do we go? What's your, you know, what, what's your hope? How do you feel? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to test? You know, we've asked very simple, short questions like that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of written response, if you have students do any kind of journaling, you know, that could be something you could bring out in, in a journaling exercise. And personal interaction, we do interviews with students. So we mm -hmm. ask point blank. Performance assessment, I, I, you know, I guess, I, I don't know, is taking it a, a, a test, a performance assessment? I, I don't, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't see I who's know. speaking. I was trying the whole time. Oh, to... it was Jane. It was okay, Jane. Okay, thank you, Jane. I, I don't know the, your pictures have disappeared. So I, um, I, excellent, excellent examples of assessment for learning, you know, asking students to kind of analyze where they are and, and, where they need to go, um, they're, they're really, really good examples. And they, um, you said they apply to one, two, and four. I, you know, I'd like, we will talk about a performance assessment, but I would think perhaps, you know, on the basis of a performance assessment that a student has done based on how they performed or the feedback they got, they could also assess themselves in like some of the ways you were talking about, like, so where am I now? You know, what, what do I need to do to bring that performance to the next level or to make it better? Right. But those are excellent examples. And now you can see you're, you're really doing a lot of assessment for learning. Anyone else? Wonder if as somebody who has taught lower levels, how I could modify these thoughts, these questions, for a lower level student to be able to communicate, respond to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, does anyone have an idea before I, you know, attempt to? Because at the lower level, they just say, teacher, I need everything. I, I, mm -hmm. I want everything. I need everything. Yeah, like, teacher, no tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but could you ask them, Alyssa? Could you ask them like, you know, like really specific questions like, 
Um, are you coming? Why are you coming to? E why are you coming to ESL class? Is it to get a better job? Is it to get a raise? Is it to a lot? Yeah, a lot at the lower levels. A lot of them don't even have. They say all. They say everything. They yeah. can't even yeah. necessarily no, communicate nothing. the specifics so, of the. But so turn it around on them, Alyssa, and ask them, "What are you good at already? What are you good at now?" You know, kind yeah. of what what are you good at now? In their language. <laughs> and let's and and you know, let's check that off the list. Like let's have a checklist and let's check that off the list. So now mm -hmm. here's five other things that we haven't checked off yet. So let's now work on those. But you know, what what are you what are you good at? You can see a picture and you know, or you can't, or you you know, and maybe maybe like a checklist kind yeah. of thing. and even like um and on, on the next slides I'm gonna the next slides are more for reference for you um, than anything. I mean, to take away with you, but one of the suggestions is just like that, Jane. You know, to maybe maybe have them brainstorm what am I good at or what I you know where what do I need to learn. But you could also even show them or talk to them about your learning targets or even those unpacked ones. You may have this you know ultimate learning target, but if you unpack it to all the different pieces underneath it. Sometimes you can have students maybe at the beginning rate themselves. Sometimes we use like a stoplight, you know, what am I good at? What do I not know at all? I, you know, I, I know, I'm not anywhere near where I would need to go. What do I maybe just need to review? And so they can um, assess themselves on those and that helps them to think of maybe where they need to go. Mm -hmm. I feel like you see you. So who, who asked the original question? Was that Alyssa? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Alyssa, I was just going to add, and I don't know, tell me if it's helpful or not. I think especially for where, where am I going? I would put it, probably put a real time frame on that. Like, where am I going between now and August? <laughs> so that, you know, you can actually achieve those steps. Cause if you can never, you know, where am I going? Well, yeah, 20 years from now, but you have to be able, they have to be achievable and we have to feel like we got someplace. So I think I would always just try to keep them as tight as possible. Um, put some time frames around them. Um, and like, what I could think I that's do in the next month to help me get closer? Yeah. You know, so right. not just have the ultimate time frame, but yeah. what what steps maybe could be um, taken. Yeah, in the past, I would do with the lower levels, like visuals, have like 20 pictures of people shopping, people banking, and they would just check every single picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What they need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, we're not asking for all time. We're asking, and I'm going to make sure you can do this by August or whatever it is, right? right. Yeah, and maybe you know, you, you with those pictures, um, you know, for students at the lower levels, you could use like that stoplight kind of mm -hmm. way, or maybe use the smiley faces. You know, like I did, showed you in that other chart. You know, <laughs> what do I feel pretty confident or happy about? What am I, you know, unhappy about? Meaning I, I can't do it or I feel like I have trouble with it, that could be a way of um, doing it without having to use a whole lot of language. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. Other ideas, you, excellent ideas, all of you. And Joan, I like the suggestion about putting a time frame. You know, it doesn't mean that, but even I know for myself, if I have goals and I don't put a time frame on, so they don't get done some of the time. So just putting a time frame on can make it more concrete and maybe realistic that something will happen. Other ideas about how to involve students. Well, I'm going to, and as I said, you know, the you can't see my Green, right, let me share again. I have here and the, the remaining, you know, the next few slides, some ideas and some of them you um, have already talked about, about how to assess students, I mean, to involve students. And um, here are some ideas for how to involve students in um, selected response um, assessment and you know, share learning targets, have students self-assess with like a, you could show them a, uh, an outline of what they're going to learn or maybe those targets, maybe, sorry, have them design sample questions for peers that they could answer and then review. And we don't have enough time for me to kind of read through these, but these are some ideas that you might want to consider for involving students. And I'd like to, um, 
I mean, these are some things that you have talked about. I'd like to go to performance assessment since that was something that there was a, like a real a question about as we started to talk about this, like how would I involve students in the performance assessment process? And, and here are some ideas. I mean, I'm, I'll just spend a minute on this. You know, first of all, share the learning targets. Um, and then I've, I've kind of taken the, the verbs from these suggestions. Um, but, you know, this is another idea for that is to, you know, as the instructor schedule, opportunities for feedback and self-assessment and revision on practice tasks before signing the, the big, you know, the actual performance tasks that might be graded or that is the final kind of summative, um, summative activity. Another way of um, really infusing assessment for learning and performance, assess performance assessment is to break a complex task into parts and then do the same thing, you know, uh, schedule opportunities for feedback and self-assessment and revision for each part. Like if, if the performance task is for students to like write a lab report or something, you know, first, the first thing they might have to do is write a hypothesis. The second part might be, you know, develop a research question, do their methods, um, you know, et cetera. And so maybe break the test down. First, we'll work on the hypothesis and, and they can get some feedback and do some self-assessment there. Then move on to the next part of what's a kind of a complex task. Um, another suggestion, and these are really all parallel, is just during the process of working on the, the performance task or the product to offer opportunities while they're working on it for revision and for you know, time for them to kind of gauge where they are and self-assess and get feedback from you and from, um, from classmates. You can incorporate goal setting into all that. Um, and then, you know, a special case is, you know, using the writing for a writing um, kind of performance assessment, using the writing process. Um, it, the writing process itself has built in opportunities for feedback and revision and involvement of students. So um, in writing, there already is kind of an established process or way of going about that. And then I'm trying to go to, you know, for personal interaction, you know, by definition, it includes a lot of student involvement. Um, so I don't have specific recommendations of strategies because students are involved in personal interaction assessment. Um, but a few things to keep in mind on, um, you know, quiet or reserved students or maybe, you know, low ESOL students might not perform well in a personal interaction context. Um, and if the purpose is to gather summative evidence and personal communication is not required, maybe consider another method. I mean, if it's oral communication skills or something, then you may, it's pr appropriate to use that um, because you can't use a written assessment, for example. Um, and make sure when you're um, using kind of less formal assessment that you generate enough information to make an adequate inference about what students know or can do, um, especially if it's for anything kind of high stakes. I was gonna add a quick comment, Susan, on that. You know, I know like for a lot of the programs, like students getting jobs is important. So that job interview piece might, you know, is probably something maybe you're practicing in your programs. I don't know what everyone's doing, but, um, you know, and I think about those quiet reserved people that don't know how to stand up and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they don't have that skill set. And, and I know I've heard other teachers talk about using like breakout rooms to do some one-on-one -on -one stuff in that and, you know, and to bounce around that way. So just a suggestion, but I, you know, it's a real, it's a real thing that, that I know programs work with, so. Susan, you're on mute, by the way. Probably You probably did that so I could talk. Okay, all right, thank you. I just was said, Joan, that's a, really, a good point. And 
I think most of us, we feel comfortable sometimes speaking in a small group than to a large group. It's, it's a little bit less risky and, and scary. So excellent point. Um, so, you know, so this is, we're just about at our, the end of our time today. And, you know, we talked about, we did some more practicing of really taking those targets apart to see what their underlying components are and, and talked about ways to assess these different um, learning targets and a, a little bit at the end about how to um, involve students. So we're using assessment for learning, not just, you know, assessment as done by the teacher. And so I thought, you know, of, is that trying to advance? Yeah. Um, you know, my question to you, and it's one of those assessment for learning questions, it's where to next? And I'm just curious to hear from you, you know, based on what we discussed in this session, or it could be last session too, what's, you know, one thing you, you might try out or put into practice in the next couple of weeks, if you're teaching, if it's not in the next couple of weeks, maybe in the fall, anything, you know, related to um, any, what we've talked about that you might want to try out or, or do um, with your students in the near future? I will, I hope to, as the fall, okay. um, yeah. and I, maybe the next week because we're in the final week, <laughs> but, um, but, but just to develop more intentional ways of mm -hmm. self-assessment. Yeah. Is that what you said? Bottom mm -hmm. one, the one at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Self-assessment. For students to have the opportunity to self-assess. Yeah, so they're yeah. intentionally knowing even at the lower levels they can self-check and self-gauge mm -hmm. and self-monitor. Right. Because um, that is that is one of the biggest, uh, I think, difficulties is the developing the need or the... Right. Or mm -hmm. the and, you know, self-assessing and even if they, if they have opportunities to um, assess their peers' work or maybe anonymous student work, it helps them internalize what the expectations are too, just the practice of assessing. Um, it can help them build their own skills. Sometimes that's a cultural thing because yeah. not all cultures have that same. Yeah, true. So you got to be sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think I saw something in the chat. Um, trying to get my mouse to. Uh, Beatrice wrote over the summer we might use target categories when planning for next classes. Beatrice, you want to say anything more about that or? No, just it's a, it is a nice framework for like brainstorming and making sure mm -hmm. we've got a diversity of things we're doing. Yeah, and I, you know, you could use different um, frameworks, like you could use Bloom ta Bloom's Taxonomy if you wanted instead, but I like, honestly, I like putting all the reasoning together and not splitting hairs about, oh, is this evaluation? Is this synthesis? Is this analysis? You know, if so reasoning processes inside our students' heads, but let's go from there. Mm -hmm. Anne, were you going to say something? I thought I saw. Uh... Well, um, I have been trying uh, to kind of, for more student involvement, um, have them asynchronously study uh, say a grammar verb tense, um, say the past tense, then the, they go off and study that on their own and then flip it so yeah. that when they come back to class, they have to teach it to me. Excellent. Um, yeah. To mm -hmm. assess what they really know or not. Yeah, that's excellent. I mean, I think that flipped classroom um, approach is really. It, I mean, I think it's effective. It's a good use of time. Yeah, so they've done that kind of background work. Then they come in and do something active with it. And um, you could cert there's certainly time to point out, you know, if they've done something wrong or, you know, um, help them improve or um, clear up misconceptions. But that's, that's a wonderful way of doing things, I think, and involves them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else?
Well, I hope that that you will, if anybody you know else who hasn't had a chance to talk or maybe hasn't, um, you know, doesn't have anything that's come to mind right now. I hope that this will be useful to you. It's really just, you know, kind of skimming the surface um, of kind of what assessment for learning can be, kind of the richness of it, um, real, some really foundational elements. Um, but I do hope that it will be helpful you as, to you as you are planning, organizing, you know, working with your students in the, in the fall or if some of you are teaching at the moment. And um, I appreciated the opportunity to meet you and spend a few hours with you over the last couple of weeks. And Joan, thank you for inviting me to be here with everybody. So thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank have you. a great summer. And it's already starting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, guys, everyone. appreciate it. Bye -bye. Have a Bye -bye. great day. Thank you you. you will see an evaluation coming at you and we okay. hope you fill it out. It's really helpful. So please do. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Now, where's my recording? You can turn it off, huh? Yes, I know. I just have to.